Thank you. Okay, we're just going to do, they can hear me okay? Wonderful. So good evening. Thank you all for being here. Um, so thank you to Michelle for inviting me to talk about sustainability, climate change, and what that means to our environment and ultimately to us as people. Um, so just, I like to always ask and assess the room, and I know online you can't do it as much, but um, does, pe do people feel that they've got a good grip of what climate change means? What's going on, the impact that we see, what how that affects our lives now and our future generations? Do people feel that they've got an okay grip on it? Want to do more? Expert in the field? Anybody want to raise their hand to okay, no, somewhat, can always learn more? <laughs> We could do more. We can always all do more. Uh, any experts in the room? Wonderful. I'll be looking to you then. Um, anybody that doesn't really know but is here to know more? Okay, good. So we've all got a, a good enough baseline. There's enough in the news, enough in the media um, for us to at least have an idea of what's going on. And we also we experience it in our daily life. So I am not a professor. Um, I have not got a PhD in sustainability or climate change, but it's come around through a passion and self-learning and launching a sustainability startup in the region and some of the global organisations that I've worked with to kind of lead me on my path of where I am today. So I'm going to talk to you a bit around what, what is climate change? What does that mean for us? And ultimately, what can we all do? It's you know, a collective responsibility for us to all change our behaviours, but also influence other people's behaviours to reverse the effects that we're seeing, like we witnessed with the flash floods and rains recently. Any questions, just stop me midway and I'm more than happy to answer. So, you see that one? Wonderful. So I've already had a wonderful introduction, so I don't need to do it again. Um, I'm from the UK, most of you can probably guess by my accent. I've been in the region 10 years. Uh, marketing is my background, working for companies like Emirates and Hilton, and that also was kind of my trajectory into my food waste startup. So working in hospitality, I saw every day how much food was going into the bin at the end of that day or that hour. Um, and then co-founded a startup called Hero Go, where we worked with farmers and food importers to rescue all those ugly, wonky, funny looking fruit and vegetables that get rejected by all the supermarkets here because they strive for the look of perfection and that perfect apple stack that we all see glistening in the supermarket. That is not how food grows, we all know it, but we're just not subjected or given the option really here yeah, to be able to purchase the unwanted. So we launched that um, company where you go online, order your groceries, all rescued, um, so reducing food waste, reducing the impact on the planet and ultimately helping because it's half the price of what you pay in a store. So that was my trajectory into sustainability. And then now um, I also work with an NGO called the Climate Fresk. So we facilitate workshops to the public, companies, schools, universities on raising climate literacy and helping people grasp really what is the whole cause and consequence and what does that mean and how can people solve the problems. So a lot of what I talk about today is based on that. Um, so anyway, I hope you enjoy. And there's going to be a bit of dual interaction. I don't want it to all be just me talking, because I'm sure most of you will switch off after a short while. So what is sustainability? So I'm sure everybody in here in the room has heard the term. Um, is it something new? No, it's definitely not. So in 1987, the UN um, Commission defined sustainability as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability for the future generations. So how are we making sure that we're not over-utilizing everything, burning everything that we've got and impacting the planet for our future generations down the line? So that was where the term, term sustainability came from, which is why I guess in the last few decades it's really picked up and that term is now commonly used throughout most language and practice. Is it a trend? So a lot of people ask the question, is it a trend? Is it something of, is it the buzzword of the decade, buzzword of the year? Um, no, I think is the answer to that one. So CO2 concentrations are rise, rising mostly because of the fossil fuels that we burn. So most of our energy these days in the world are all based on fossil fuel, coal, gas, or natural gas and oil. Um, and we can see the pre-industrial era the kicking in in the 60s and then the post-industrial era really kicking off 
of when we all started to indulge in a lot more of things that we bought, the way that things were manufactured. Um, so that's why we see an exponential growth in the CO2 emissions that we have on the planet. So it's gone from uh, 11 tonnes of CO2 uh, emitted per year in 20, uh, 1960 to 36 billion tonnes in 2023. So it has tripled in that amount of time. But what do we do with that, all that additional carbon? What does that mean? Where does it go? What happens? Because you can't see it, right? It's, it's transparent, but you can see it in the effects that it's causing on the planet. Um, what is climate change? So obviously we see this probably every week in a media headline, in a newspaper, an online article. Uh, people talk about it. Um, and I think there's become this huge kind of fear around the term and everybody's kind of unsure what to do with it, unsure how to approach it, what does it mean? There's a lot of negative doom and gloom. Um, so it basically return, refers to a long-term shift in weather patterns. So I guess the difference between a weather forecast is what's gonna happen for now in the next 10 days, but actually climate is over a long-term period. So that's how we define the difference of what a long-term period of climate change is. And some of this can be um, climate change impact that we see, some of it obviously is natural. Uh, we've gone through glacial and um, post-glacial regions with ice change. But since the 1800s, human activities have been the main driver of climate change. And like I mentioned, the fossil fuels that we're using with gas, natural um, natural gas, oil and coal. Um, greenhouse effect, anybody heard of what the greenhouse effect is? Yeah. So we have to have it, because if we didn't have a greenhouse effect, the temperature would be 33 degrees lower than what it is today and i'm sure none of us want to live in that temperature and wouldn't survive in that temperature either but what's happening is with all the additional co2 that we're producing like i just mentioned with 3x in 70 years the planet's not able to cope so think of it as there is a natural greenhouse effect that kind of surrounds the planet with a blanket but there's more and more blankets being put onto the planet so what happens if we went into bed with one blanket versus 10 blankets by the time that 10th blanket is on, we're suffocating, we're sweating, we are ridiculously hot. So it's the same thing for the planet. We're absorbed, we're emitting more uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is increasing our additional greenhouse effect, which means the natural parts of releasing energy and bringing it back are not able to happen. So we're consuming more energy within the planet, increasing our temperature and increasing climate change. So we want to reduce the amount of additional blankets that we're putting around the planet. Um, what is our climate doing? So I think we all can feel probably every few years, especially those that have been in the region for many years, um, the climate change that we're seeing. The UAE versus the 1970s has seen a two degree increase in the summer months versus then, which sounds tiny, but actually I'll show you something where we were in the ice age 20,000 years ago, and it's not far off of a, a temperature difference to that. So we can start to see here, where we were tracking and all of a sudden in 2023 versus 2024, we've already seen a huge jump in our climate that we're experiencing now day to day. So obviously the more we emit, <laughs> the more people we are on the planet, we are also gonna to start to see that further increase and further increase, which is not good because that obviously impacts A, our ability to live, the way that our, um, we coexist, the way that we are biodiversity, the way that we would grow our food, weather patterns, uh, water cycles, everything is impacted, you know, from ice sheets melting to um, sea level rising. So everything is impacted by this temperature increase. So this is why I'm kind of showing you that the, the jump over all of these years, in the 1800s, we've seen a massive jump only just in this last year as well. Um, has anybody heard of COP, COP28 that we hosted last year? Um, so obviously it started in 2015, uh, COP21 it was called, um, the conference of the parties where 196 nations all come together and it was called the Paris Agreement where they committed to setting a threshold that by the year 2100 um, we would not exceed a temperature increase of plus 1.5 degrees Celsius um, versus pre-industrial era. Um, how are we doing on that? <laughs> Not great. Um, so whilst it's, it's measured over a long period of time, in 2023 alone, every day of the year, we saw an, an increase greater than 1.5 degrees temperature increase, which again sounds tiny, 
but that has huge effects because we're seeing glaciers melt, we're seeing ice sheets melt, we're seeing biodiversity you know, destroyed because of the heat of the ocean, we're seeing droughts happen, we're seeing extreme rainfall like we had the other week happen. So we are way off, uh, which is why I think now you're starting to see a lot more ramp up conversation about the climate crisis, the climate emergency. And there was a lot of discussion around energy transition, um, moving away from fossil fuels, obviously at COP28 that happened in the country. So yeah, uh, we were meant to have peaked our fossil fuel usage by 2025. And then by the year 2030, which is obviously just around the corner, we need to decline our fossil fuel usage by 43%. So yeah, we're definitely not on track to reach anywhere near that. Um, what does that mean if we exceed the 1.5 degrees? Where did that 1.5 degree limit come from? So there's um, a, a report uh, created by the IPCC, the into, <laughs> no worries, um, where they assess the impact if we had plus 1.5 versus plus two. What's the, what's the difference really between just half a degree? Could we afford to go to plus two degrees versus pre-industrial era? Or actually, do we need to stick to max 1.5? And actually, it came out to say that we need to stick to plus 1.5 because that half a degree increase in temperature has detrimental effect mainly on the ocean and the heat of the ocean, melting of ice, loss of biodiversity. So that, that increase in heat we see, I mean, I think even just over the last few years, we've seen wildfires happening in Australia, flash floods happening all over the world. We've seen droughts happening um, obviously, which is leading to famines, climate crisis, climate refugees. And not only that, it affects health. We're also getting a large amount of disease. We just you know, witnessed it here with cholera um, through our you know, poison water system. Um, livelihoods, people's businesses have been ruined, and we've witnessed that in our own country. Food security. So we're fortunate that 90% of our food is imported into this country. So whilst the UAE is doing a lot of work to improve food security, if that had happened largely in farming lands, that would be a nation's food wiped out and where countries and regions or towns are very much reliant on local agriculture to feed themselves, that is then detrimental to not be able to feed people and the famines arrive. Um, so just a, a few little facts. Anybody want to have a guess? So we're over, almost over that plus 1.5 degree increase versus pre-industrial era. Does anybody want to have a guess of how many do or how many parts of that degree humans have caused that increase of temperature? Anybody think half a degree we contributed towards and everything else is kind of additional? One degree? 1.5, anybody? So one degree. So again, obviously this is all you know hypothetical. There is no exact science to calculating it, but humans of human activity has caused a, a degree increase in temperature because the way that we live, we drive our cars, we have our air conditioning on, manufacturing, production, consumption. Um, so we definitely need a bit of an about turn in the way that we live. Um, the Arctic has warmed four times faster than the rest of the world since 1979. So obviously we know what lives in the Arctic and the, the impact that that has on our water systems. So if we're not able to keep the regularity of, of our water systems, that's ultimately gonna impact everything. The temperature that we have, the rivers that people depend on for water, you know, um, avoiding drought, supporting our agricultural systems in the world. Uh, Africa warmed 0.3 degrees per decade between 1991 and 2020, faster than the global average. So <laughs> majority of carbon emissions, actually two thirds of the world's emissions come from two countries, um, US and China. Um, but there's countries that are, I guess, underdeveloped countries that are feeling the biggest impact. And they're the ones that don't have the financial security to be able to combat things of climate change. We were very fortunate in this country that the government held their hand up and said, anybody's homes that have been ruined, that are not covered by insurance, we will support companies giving away vouchers to help people replace furniture, food being delivered to people, because we're in a very fortunate country, but there's other countries where they cannot afford to do that. So obviously it's, you know, we are contributing and this country especially is a huge contributor, but unfortunately it's the, you know, 
developing countries that are feeling some of the biggest impact for our lifestyle. Um, anybody know how many people live on our planet now? Eight billion. Well, slightly cut off. Any ideas of how many people lived on this planet 70 years ago? Two point five. So we've done a great job of populating the world, um, probably a little bit too much, <laughs> um, and we're we're growing rapidly. So not only are we seeing a crisis of the the planet not being able to absorb the amount of emissions that we're producing with eight billion, but the rate of growth that we're going through, the planet is definitely not going to be able to sustain that for decades and centuries to come. Um, anybody want to have a go or guess at which country, no, I didn't, I took it out of there, uh, which country emits the most carbon dioxide in the world? For China, you're right. Yeah, huge amounts. Um, so they are a huge emitter but they also consume and export the most coal in the world. They've got, um, they're home to half the world's coal power plants. Do they import or they export? Both. Um, uh, so they're also, they're, they're doing a lot around renewable energy. Um, but yes, when they are consuming and utilizing fossil fuels, probably the most or the most in the world, uh, no wonder. There is also a massive shift of people to urbanization and um, areas within China as well. So that's having an even bigger impact in the way that the, I guess the cities are being formed and their emissions that are in like a small area. Um, also the world's fifth largest oil producer and the second largest oil consumer. Um, so there are a huge consumer, second biggest population in the world. Um, and then not far after that, I heard a few United States mentioned European Union with a good cluster together here, um, India, and then you see Saudi and the UAE. So the UAE with such a tiny population, we made it into the top, not something to be proud of um, compared to a population like China, for example. So that whilst that's not entirely fair for China because they also produce and manufacture for majority of the world, hence their coal consumption as well, um, there's another way that we also look at it is per capita. So how much are we consuming per capita per country? And you can see here, yeah, I don't know if you can see that on the screen, but UAE produces 22 tonnes per capita versus India, which is 1.6, and China, which is 6.8. So we are way, 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 way ahead <laughs> of anybody else. Um, Bahrain, Qatar, UAE, Saudi Arabia. Um, are some or are the biggest per capita contributors for emissions. Again, because the lifestyles we lead, we all drive cars, um, we all have our air conditioning on most of the year in some way, shape or form. Um, the energy that we use, the, the lifestyles that we lead, the, the things that we buy, the way that we consume, and the amount that we fly within this country as well. So we are big, big consumers, big emitters. Um, but you know, why, why should we care? Like, what, what does that mean? What's my own personal contribution really matter to the planet? Um, so the Paris Agreement then said, okay, so we, to be able to hit our target of plus 1.5 degrees, we need to have an understanding of how much, um, how many emissions, how many tons of emissions people should be producing. So with the UAE, we produce 22 tonnes. Any idea what the target that was set out in COP21 in the Paris Agreement of how many tonnes we should emit to try and reach that only 1.5 degree increase? You mean we, every citizen of the world? Or yes. we in this country? We, every citizen of the world. So it's an, a, an average, yeah. so some will be higher, some will be lower, but not far off. Mm -hmm. Two. So we're in the UAE, we emit 22 tons. 
per year. But actually, for HIT, the 1.5 degrees, we should only be emitting two. Well, I mean, a little bit. You'd have to do a little bit more of turning on and off lights if you were lighting up a whole community, maybe. But to give you an example, my one flight a year Dubai to London is my annual quota done. I fly more than once a year. So I think there's a... No, per passenger. Per passenger. So, but I'm not saying take trains, buses, cars and six weeks to get across Europe, but I think it's just to give you a bit of context to say we are, we've got a long way to go to be able to reach that. I've personally done an exercise with a company where I, where I calculate my own personal consumption and emissions um, and we try and strip back everything that we do to try and reach two tons. So the amount that we fly, the car that I drive, the food that I consume, the products that I buy, um, the way I recycle, the energy that I use, and the lowest I could get it to, to live a very basic lifestyle, lifestyle was seven. Any, any data out of what during pandemic? When actually nobody was flying, nobody was driving? Or Not that us. I know of. I think it's another pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> Well, maybe alternative, yeah, alternative views on that one. But we were definitely living um, a lot more of a modest lifestyle, right? We weren't in, we saw that with wildlife in the UAE, abundant, like camels running through communities, dolphins in the marina. Um, so I think the idea is here to kind of set the scene of we are in this region, we are huge emitters and we are far off global average. Obviously, there will be regions that and countries that over emit and there'll be countries and regions that under emit to balance out. But um yeah, we are we are away. We've got a way to go. What's the biggest contributor, you know, in, in sort of our daily existence? Is it the car? Is it the AC? Is it the flight? Energy. Actually, I'll showcase that in a minute of what contributes to overall global emissions, but the energy that we use. So the way that we fuel our cars, the way that we provide energy for our air conditioning, the way that these lights come on. We use fossil fuel, and fossil fuel is, is the biggest emitter for the emissions that we see on the planet that are causing, which is why there's so much focus on shifting towards renewable energy. So solar, hydrogen, water, you name it. Did you hear me? What power station do you use the Coal, is it? Who is it? Who? Gas. Gas? Yeah. Yeah. Still gas. Yeah. Yeah. Still gas, because nuclear as well. I know that's a big solar power, but it only... How much of the percentage is nuclear? I don't know. I can find out the answer, but I don't know. Uh, on the flight situation, it does depend on which class you're flying. It might seem odd, but actually, it matters a lot because the activities of going preparing for first class versus economy, the whole supply chain before it reaches the plane is what it in. Well, the food that you consume, the weight of the chair, the amount of people that you can fit into a first class environment versus an economy, you've obviously got a far lower amount of people. For example, your calculation of seven was based, sorry, the two groups that flying mm. economy or flying with the people. So it, it didn't calculate based on my class of travel, it just said a flight. Okay. So, Twenty twenty one, UAE used thirty percent oil, sixty five percent natural gas, three percent nuclear. Okay. Production. So, just so I can repeat it for these guys, the UAE in twenty twenty one used three percent nuclear power. How much? Sixty four percent natural gas. Sixty four percent natural gas. And thirty percent oil. So yeah, I mean we're huge 
only three percent in uh, solar. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. What's the issue? The renewable. I know many sure it's not mentioned. Plus three, this kind of three percent. So I think it's 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 so it's not about will our, our planet exist. Our planet will exist. Um, just, yeah, <laughs> with a different life form. Um, yeah, so you guys will very well know. Um, the latest ice age, we can call it that, peaked about 20,000 years ago. Uh, and global temperatures for this sheet of ice across kind of Europe and what we now call Europe. Does anybody want to have a go at what the, the difference in temperature was? Obviously, minus versus what it is today. On average, we're about 15 degrees um, on the planet today. Does anybody want to have a go at how many degrees lower the planet was to reach Ice Age? <laughs> no, it would make sense, but no. Anybody else? <laughs> no. Five degrees. So when I was saying that, like 0.5 degree of should we be plus 1.5 versus the industrial era in Celsius or plus two? And you know, what's half a degree? We don't really feel half a degree in temperature change, but the planet definitely does. Um, so if we had, we were living, we weren't, but the planet was existing um, at you know, a five degree difference, and now we even live in a plus five degree temperature change. Um, so it's different. We've, we've kind of flipped in and out of these glacial periods over time, or glacial, and now we're in this interglacial period that we live in. Um, and they reckon that we've done this around 17 times over 10,000 years. And they kind of do that by drilling the ice and looking at what happened in the ice. Um, so we know that we'll go back at some point potentially into another ice age or a glacial period. But what becomes really difficult is the rate that we are impacting our climate through our human activities makes it very difficult to predict what's going to happen in thousands and tens and thousands of years. So that was just a bit of a, a reference to say, a one degree temperature change makes a huge difference in the way that the planet exists. So what does that mean? So enough doom and gloom. <laughs> um, but the idea is now that actually people, we, we want to make sure that people have an idea of what does that really mean? What's going on on the planet? You know, we can see by our day-to-day -day lives of, you know, what's actually happening to us and people around us. That is very blurry when it's that big, isn't it? Um, but it's time to act. There is no planet B, I love that phrase. We don't have time to reverse. Um, I do a lot of work with schools and universities and actually the kind of Gen Z age are hyper, hyper, hyper aware around climate change. Um, they're taught in schools, it's part of their curriculum, they're already, you know, forming committees of how to change it, they're champion, sustainability champions internally within the schools of what they can do, what they can change with their families, how they educate their parents and their grandparents to change their way of living. I do a book, but I think you can see them walking, bicycling, taking the bus, or they just want to bring one to say, yes, you should do that and I'm going to have my new iPhone. <laughs> The next sort of like, yeah, the real thing, or it's just something like it's talking to you. So, I think, like anything, right? Like, when I let's say I'm, I'm doing a workshop and we do it in small groups, but usually there's about kind of 30 40 students in a room, you'd always get maybe 10 20 percent that are very, very dedicated. They want to stay behind afterwards, they want to talk to you about like what more they can contribute in the workshops that I do. Um, it's through a card game. At the end, we have a whole solution session. So what are you physically going to commit, whether you're an adult or a child? What are you physically going to pledge and commit to doing? It's on a post-it note. I've got some in my bag for you all. Um, what are you going to commit? Some great, you leave the session. Some are still stuck on the table. They don't care, they're out. But some are going around collecting them all, taking them back to their classrooms. And the teacher tells us they've pinned them all on the board. And actually, they're the ones saying to the other students, did you do that? Where are you with that? Um, so there's a, there's a real mix of, yes, obviously they're still going to want probably the latest iPhone. They're not going to buy a second-hand iPhone. 
Um, but you do get some that are hyper aware of what they need to do and how they need to live. But we do do a session of what activities can you do that don't emit carbon? And it gets them thinking, well, okay, well, actually, maybe I could walk to school because it's only 500 metres down the road in the winter months. I don't need the driver to drop me off. Or actually, maybe I don't need to sit on my PlayStation. I could probably go outside and just play football because that doesn't use electricity and, and fossil fuels to be able to power it. Or actually, maybe when I go to Carrefour, I don't need to buy 15 packs of Oreos. I can just buy the one. And when that's finished, I buy more. And I'm not wasting the rest that sit in the cupboard. Um, so it's just trying to... And a big one is air conditioning. I think a lot of children that have grown up in this region are very used to air conditioning. Um, and when we say to them, just change the temperature, just increase it by a degree or two, your consumption will, will decrease. Yeah, but it, it makes me that uncomfortable. It's a bit warm. But just try it. Try it in your classroom now. And we'll change it in the classroom. And by the end of it, they haven't even noticed that the temperature's gone up two degrees. So it's, it's kind of nudging them. Um, so it's a reliance on, hey, self-learning, right? But also what they're taught, how their families will support it. Yeah, so a very, very good question. It's almost like what we call a, a triangle of inaction. So there's almost, the, it's a bit further down my slides, but it's almost like, well, it, it's your responsibility. It's not mine. What can I do? What can, what can individual Donna do? to help reverse this. I can't change the energy that I use because I, don't, I can't go and build a hydrogen plant. And that, what I mean is that the good thing is that it's not often building because there is a dumb dumb consumer who can show that it's really sizable. And I don't think it's scary for people to do this. That's what they're doing. Yeah, but I think it's, the, the, the triangle of inaction is saying there's individuals, there's governments, and there's corporations. Coca-Cola, I don't know if anybody saw it in the news last week, came out as the biggest plastic contributor in the world, plastic waste contributor in the world. What can we do as consumers? Well, there could be an uprising to push back that we no longer will buy products with plastic. Coca-Cola will definitely start to feel... Slightly different, but not... <laughs> But yeah, I think that there's there's ways that um, not everybody will, right? Which is where you'll get your climate activists that will take that role. Um, but it's, it's the triangle in action. It's not just the government's responsibility. It's not just you as an individual responsibility. It's not just the corporation's responsibility. It's this collective responsibility that everybody needs to work together. You know, sustainability, sustainable products is now almost a prerequisite from Gen Z before they'll even buy they want to understand your sustainability goals. They want to know if you're a registered B Corp. They want to understand like what you know, ESG or environmental social um, activities you've got going on before they'll even consider you as a brand. So even if the brands aren't doing it themselves, the uprising will force them to do it because they'll lose out on their growing business. And that's really the case because I keep seeing this also, like, you know, how marketing stuff and so on, but in reality, those people who talk, who talk with you about sustainability and all of that, then they go and make one million dollars for she, and they do fine. <laughs> and I don't think we can ever go and live like cavemen again, right? Where no one's going to willingly go and opt. Cavemen, uh, literally hundred dollars for like one year fast product fashion. from China. Yeah, and look, fast fashion is a terrible contributor. Um, as many things that we do, right? Um, food waste is one of the biggest contributors. You know, thirty percent of food systems contribute to our emissions, which is crazy, right? Um, so it's just a amazing and amazing about not only everything from agriculture, growing livestock. Obviously, cows is a huge contributor. There's like one billion cows on this planet um, with deadly methane and other greenhouse gases that they're contributing to, and we consume. We're very huge meat consumption, apart from some people in the room that are vegetarian. Um, so how can we start to change some of our lifestyle? And we're not saying everybody be vegetarian. I am not, I still eat meat. But maybe there's a, a meat-free Monday that you do instead. And this is some of the work that we do with the schools as well to say, 
maybe you just change one day, even once a month. Or when you go to a restaurant, rather than ch choosing the beef burger, maybe choose the chicken burger. It doesn't always have to be that way. So it's just trying to help like small nudges because nobody overnight is going to completely change and say, right, well, I'm only buying from ethical fashion brands because the cost is going to be considerable. The options are limited. So people may dabble in a bit of both. Hopefully not she and versus sustainable brands, but um oh sorry, yeah, go on. Okay. I was just going to add in that uh 30 years ago, the economist had an interesting article that I still remember today very well, which articulated how if you chose in the UK, and they said in London, from a supermarket, meat from New Zealand or meat mm -hmm. from Wales. The carbon footprint of that yep. was dramatic in terms of difference. And in short, the abattoirs are not set up very efficiently in Wales. They are set up very efficiently in New Zealand because they know they have to export. They've also got better, comparatively better, humane conditions for the abattoirs. All of that. But even with that, so it's substantially different and better to buy in New Zealand compared to the Welsh plant. The biggest contribution per mile or per kilometer was when you went to pick up the meat from the from the store. So here we drive a lot, right? But if you could walk, obviously that would be better, right? But the well, we get a delivery. <laughs> well, they have to change it. It's that last mile of the difference because logistics, supermarkets fundamentally are a logistics firm. You see them as a retail outlet, but if they don't manage their logistics, they are not going to make money fast. All right, so they make that very efficient. When the likes of Marks and Spencer had plan A, there is no plan B. Well, the reality on that was it's a very important uh, show of, of their hand. They made a lot of money on that because, like it or not, when you buy a big pouch of, let's say, soap for your cleaning of your items at home, well, it made far more sense for them to have it packaged. They could put more units on a truck. They could spend, they put more units on the shelves to sell to you. They could divert, divert back. So the mm -hmm. far more money that they could make that margin on being plan A, more ecological, so bigger packages, not the tiny shapes of the right? right? There are lots of things which we take for granted in this, in lots of different ways. You know, the green CO2 footprint is one aspect of it, ethical, fair trade is another. But we are, as a consumer, we need to become more educated on it. And that's where your work is really important. Right, because we are often quite unequal in these aspects. Yeah, yeah, it's very true. Like the, the food mile, we all see it when we go to the supermarket and we're looking at a vegetable. Um, there'll be the, the locally grown UE item, and there'll be another item from Iran, Pakistan, a fraction of the price. Consumers are influenced mostly by price, so they're going to choose that far cheaper product that's imported, that has additional food miles, et cetera, versus supporting food that's just driven down the road. But turning it around the other way, we live in a desert and we are producing food. It doesn't make sense. So the cost of producing that food should actually be 20 rather than two. It's, it would be better for the country to have more than it is to import, like to pay to grow that, and then import it across, like it would have got this scale. We shouldn't be food independent here. Because, huh? yeah. yeah, I mean, there's, I guess I was quite similar until I started working with the farmers in my startup and seeing how they grow organic farms as well that are not heavily fertilizer. Obviously, we're a bit restricted. We've got, you know, a lot of unarable land. Water scarcity is real. Um, you know, we're in an arid climate, not great for growing crops all year round. So pretty much from now, until probably September time, there will be very few crops grown. So there's a lot of work done by the UE government to increase our food security. Um, during COVID, you know, we were very we were very fortunate that we got food through the door. Um, but a lot of countries weren't, right? We saw shelves empty, people selling out of food that was not food able. I mean, even on the days of the floods, there was, you know, people in Sharjah that couldn't even get access to food restaurants that weren't able to provide food because their suppliers couldn't get in. Um, so if there's a further impact of that food being delivered, there's a bigger issue for the, the country working on food security. So, oh yes, go ahead. The, the carbon emissions for the big brand, are they published? 
depends what their it depends what their um goals are. So some will. Yeah, so there's um instead of buying this product, you can buy a similar product. So you mean awareness to the consumer of it? Yeah, so some do, some don't. Um big corporations. Do we see Coca-Cola talking about the benefit of buying Coke out of an aluminium can versus a plastic bottle? I personally haven't seen anything. But actually, it's far better to buy it out of an aluminium can because of the production required to produce plastic. It's only got a short-term recyclable life cycle. And then what happens with that? It goes into landfill, it goes into the ocean, and we're all consuming microplastics. It's killing our biodiversity. So yes, they should be held liable for communicating and educating with the responsibility that they have. Why there's no action possible to sustainability is targeted to the masses. But who controls that? Who says, so the, U, the UN created the Sustainable Development Goals. And this was a bit of a marketing tactic, to be quite honest, to say we need to make it, you know, layman terms for people to understand from an environmental and social point of view, what do we need to do to all live and coexist together? So the idea of this was, and I was in a workshop last week, that companies can say, right, based on our company and our goals for the company, what can we align to in here, commit to it, improve it, and then we, there is some form of governance, right? Report on it, and whether you share that internally, externally, to shareholders in annual reports if you're publicly listed, to consumers. So there are in yeah. Europe, yes. Yeah. So based on this, because what is happening now? That we are trying to gather a couple of tons from each consumer. And if we manage to do this with one big producer, of course, in, the, the needle is going to shift a lot quicker. So we are just trying to uh, collect the grounds while we can get big chunks if we target the sources. If the sources became more sustainable. So the Europe, Europe are doing, and I don't know legislation inside out, but the Europe are uh, far, they're ahead a lot further than what other regions are in enforcing governance. So there are, there will be penalties, there will be targets that consumers have to, uh, companies have to meet to reduce, to reach net zero. We all hear a lot about reach net zero by 2030, by 2050, because there will be penalties. There will be things that companies have to uphold to for that local legislation, whether it's on city level or country level. Um, no, because I could be here for another hour no, talking. I feel, <laughs> I feel like I have a very basic for recycling, but I'm not sure that it's energy well spent always. No, and look, I've got, um, hang it's on, let me just go to the, to oh, it's in my clip. I'm not sure that it's. So I guess that we're all conditioned to think, um, and you're kind of going to steal one of my quiz questions in a minute, but I'll, I will do this one now. Um, who thinks that, what did I get to? Yes. Uh, who thinks that a plastic versus glass, you know, lowest emitter of, who thinks that plastic is the lowest emitter of emissions? Who thinks that a glass, glass bottle? Glass is more glass. You can recycle it to like nine parts. Okay. Yeah, so we're, we're all, we're, but, so plastic is seen as the enemy, but actually glass is a lot better to produce because it uses, um, far. glass uses a lot more heat, but actually it has a lot better recyclability option, whereas plastic doesn't. So actually if you had to choose a product, you'd choose plastic. Also in here, so it doesn't really affect the plastic too much, other than like this again. Yeah, this is the problem with the transport costs. So it's heavier, but it's, yeah, so actually the whole, like, should I choose glass or plastic? So we would... I'm very, very confused, because when you start thinking from this perspective here, this, again, going to microplastics, end up in the, in the rivers, in the ocean, and the landfills, and so on. But this one is taking less energy to produce right now. And then, like, as a but you're, user, you're never going to... You don't know all those details. And you don't go into a store and say, yeah, glass, plastic. But you get to 
Right lines like either or because it's really overwhelming. And then you literally sit and spend in like hours and hours. You started from one small city, you ended up in the other uh, <laughs> side of the planet, and you research uh, and you see too many five areas, you still cannot understand it. But by this, this it's a comp this it's a very complex topic, which is why I started out in this session saying I am not a professor. <laughs> I cannot answer everybody's questions and give you that solution. My, my worry is not so much for whether it's better to be plastic or glass. It's actually, is what we do making a difference? If I put my glass or plastic or aluminium in the recycling, in my providers, there's one bin for all of these different things paper, glass, aluminium, plastic, and, and so on. I think there's a lot of. And then I'm so sure, I'm still not sure, I hope and really hope that it does go and get sorted and does get recycled. Because in other countries, there are separate yeah, yeah. for different kinds of waste. And in some things in the malls, you get, you know, uh, general waste, paper, aluminium, but no glass, or, or something's missing. To me, I'm not or sure. a bit of food. Yeah. Well, that's often general waste. Yeah. And they're thinking, but where, where's the paper? Why is there no place for paper here? Or why is there no place for aluminium cans here? I'm worried that it's and we're going to always choose the right place to keep it. Always dump it in each other. Yeah, yeah, look, I think the whole... Um... And it's, yes, it, so we had, a few years ago, we had an incident talk by a recycling uh, person who came and spoke to us, and he actually said, well, certain things cannot be recycled in this country. Cellophane, yep. um, styrofoam, kind of plastic bags and things. At that point, he said, well, don't bother trying to put them in the plastic. Only put plastic like hard plastic. Hard plastic. Yeah, in this country, like a yogurt pot. Mm -hmm. technology to recycle, and maybe there isn't any level of other countries. So obviously there's, there's government level, municipality level recycling. I can't speak in, in detail about that. I, I don't know it, I'm not an expert in it. But, but there are there are other companies that, that do recycling, right, beyond um, Tess Gio. Yes. Yes. Now there's Airfads, Biha, thank you, that's the one I'm trying to think of. Uh, Biha based out of Sharjah. Um, there's a lot of small startups as well that do kind of electronic recycling, plastic recycling, clothes recycling. Do we, do we generally have faith that this recycling works in this country? I think, that's, I think that's part of the problem. People don't have the trust. Yeah. To know you don't see where it goes, you don't see the input, you don't see the plant, you don't see the output. And normally, nine percent is actually inside. So, as no matter what, and this is a global number, it's not about this country, but this country is oil because it's wrong. I don't know exactly. One reason is because it's not easy, another reason is because only certain types of plastic can be recycled, so the most types of plastic cannot be recycled. I think we've all been conditioned to think, a bit like choose the plas uh, choose the glass, not plastic, that recycling is a solution. Yeah. It's, it's not. Solution. Reducing consumption, yeah. like single use, which I'm going to point you out. Um, but people in the room with plastic bottles, maybe we start to carry these around. You know, one thing that I, when I worked at Hilton, uh, we obviously had a lot of conferences, meetings and events. Um, and we, years ago, this must be five years ago now, we shifted majority of our events to green events. So there were no plastic bottles. You got a glass and there was a fountain and that's how you got your water. You're not going to be given a plastic glass. A lot of our catering then went meat free. Um, the catering visuals were massively reduced because there was so much food left over at the end of the event. There was no lovely paper and pencils on the table um, that people scribble on and that gets thrown in the bin at the end of the day. Um, so I think it's just trying to reduce our single use item as much as we can, right? From the plastic that we get our food takeaways in, the carrier bags, even whether they're paper or plastic, 
They still have to go somewhere. They still have to go to landfill. They still have to biodegrade. They still have to be recycled. Whereas if you're using a reusable bag, the manufacturing of that is once and you will use that until the day it's done. Um, because I know that a lot of people, they're just so used for the convenience and they actually don't think that they can't be sold. So we started, yeah, yeah. we started it in the UK because there was demand for it. I still think this is good because the people come to the next plan for the construction. Did you ever see any construction place that separates and, and thinks about recycling? They chuck everything on one end, right? And they recycle it in general. But they don't even, I mean, I've seen wood and plastic and everything. They just put it all together and look at what they do. And the percentage wise, I read something that that's the biggest contributor. Yeah, construction, building, yeah. there are uh, cement and then yeah. the other materials that are built uh, made. There are they are a huge contributor at this end. I'm not obviously for every sector industry product because this page would be <laughs> beyond readable. Um, but it's just to give you an idea of aviation, we think is the devil flying actually with fly too much, but it only contributes to two percent of the world's emissions. So yes, we could be more conscious in the routes that we travel. Google have a little eco green flag or green leaf to help you choose a more eco route, whether you're driving or flying. Great, good to know. Maybe I choose going via Istanbul versus going via somewhere else. Um, but the transport that we use for everything, for all human activity, and obviously the big one is, is energy, the energy that we use. So yes, we can't, unless you work in the energy industry, we can't control the energy transition but we as individuals can control our usage of that energy. So turning off the air conditioning when we're not in the room, turning off the lights, looking at the cars that we drive. You know, we all probably came here pretty much in individual cars tonight. You know, what are the ways that we could group together sometimes to reduce the double the amount of emissions and the amount of cars that are on the road in the UAE? We all feel that traffic pain there. So this is just to give you a bit of an idea. I'm conscious of the time because it's nine o'clock. Um, how do we reduce our personal footprint? So I don't, I don't, whether I'm doing a climate fresh workshop or any kind of speaking event, there is no one solution. We don't present these are the solutions and this will fix all the problems in the world because it is so hyper personalized, dependent on a your lifestyle, um, your economic background, the community that you live in, the house type that you live in, um, the city that you live in, the country that you live in. So there's so many different varieties. I guess, varying reasons and opportunities, for solutions to change. But these, this is what we teach in the Climate Fresh Workshop, but these are the four human activities. So we all use buildings for something. We all use transport, whether it's meat that's being flown in from New Zealand or to drive or to fly or um, take a taxi somewhere. We all eat, so agriculture, whether it's vegetables, meat, etc. And we all require industry. So how can we, in these four areas, start to help reduce our impact? So one thing we always say to the school children, um, industry, when you've finished with your bike, because now you're too big for that bike, what do you do with it? Do you go and take it to the tip or just chuck it in the bin out the front and the machine comes and takes it and crushes it? Some say yes. And then some say, no, no, we're gonna hand that down to our cousin, our brother, our sister, our neighbor. Um, same with books. What do we do with books at the end of term? Just throw them. No, nope. we're going to repurpose them. We're going to give them to somebody. We're going to donate them. We're going to find alternative ways. I think that applies for everybody. How can we waste less, buy less, reduce our meat consumption, be more conscious of the way that we travel, the way that we live, the air conditioning that we use. Um, yeah, and, and create a circular economy rather than recycle. So if we can avoid recycling, how can we do something else with a particular item? Not always possible, but whether that's book drives, sharing books, um, sharing items that you no longer use, swapping clothes. There are other ways that we can all start to do it that you know we would have lived in those times many years ago. I put this up earlier. Does, have people heard of the SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals set by the UN? So we all probably work for a company somewhere or have done at some time or know people that do. Um, so I'd always, if you don't have a sustainability lead within the company, doesn't mean you can't be the champion to start to look like whether you're big, small, local, multinational, 
start to review through the UN SDGs, which ones you think your company could align to and where you can shift opportunity. So something simple with zero hunger, very tiny um, meal donations. So for every grocery box I sold, we donated two meals to charity every time. And at least once a month, we donated 10,000 meals. Tiny little piece out of the operation, but it was just helping to make sure that our community here were well fed and they had you know, nutritious food. But what could you do in any of these areas? And you can read the detail of them. <laughs> it is a lot of work, but uh, I think it's it's worthwhile because you can start to understand how you can make that shift, how your company could make that shift and how you could be an internal advocate to do that. Now, are we all... I've got about five questions. Are we all tapped out of hearing me talk? Are we out of time? No, we all still raring to go? Wonderful. Because <laughs> I'm getting sick of the sound of my own voice. I've got a few questions from the remote audience. Oh, wonderful, yep. yes. Uh, so, you had uh, Shani mentioning that the wine mushrooms were of great, so a good price earlier on, right? And... Uh, Kamani. Oh, oh, Armani, sorry. Where you can say shops in the UK were big in the 90s. Um, and the packaging effect differentiated them. Yeah, we didn't. I mean, I tried to remember as a child. I, I, we used to go to the, the green grocer, the local vegetable shop, and you'd fill your paper bag with apples. They didn't come in these plastic, shiny packets that we see food come in these days. So, yeah. No point. But yeah, it's, and there are lots of diversity in that number, right? So on average, where's the plastic? I might use one. If you have to use the, the sturdy bag three times, then it's worse off. Yeah, and we make we're we're slowly making those shifts, right? It came with the what five fills per bag. And I think most of the people in the country were like five fills. I'm paying five hundred dirham for a, a two day shop, but what's five fills for a bag? But you know, now the removal of plastic and single use plastics is you know a commitment from the country. People are forced. I actually had a meeting last year with someone from the municipality, and I said, why why go down the five fills route? Why not just remove them? People are then forced. Because when you can't take your shopping home, you're gonna remember next time to bring your bag. But the idea was they wanted to just make a small nudge towards people, but now they've got to the point where obviously they've not seen the reduction they wanted to, so now people will be forced. They'll be, you know, they're talking about penalties for food waste. Quite sure how that's gonna happen, but tracking food waste that each household then contributes towards because it's we are here in Saudi are the biggest food waste contributors in the world we contribute to what well, we produce give 220 kilos of food waste per year per person that's yeah very that's ridiculous yeah, but also personal contribution, household waste here is a huge contributor. Oh, I think, yeah, I think we are really personal with the way more because people here can afford more, so we care less. We went, bought a lot of stuff, we went to the fridge, forgot about the town, we all the products, and then we'll buy another one. And Ramadan, on average, we waste about two kilos of food per day, which is about eight bowls of rice. Ramadan, that doubles because we put on the wonderful spread, right? We want to look hospitable. We want to give people that feeling of, you know, welcomeness. Um, but also that means there's a lot of food wasted at the end of the, the day. Freezer. Yep, I have uh, <laughs> two giant freezers full of food. Um, but yes, I think it's, it, it's also cultural, right? So, you know, some cultures in the UK, you would always freeze your leftovers. I've got my dinner from tonight in the car, if you're not getting too warm in there. Um, yeah, that's how I was brought up. Boil the, boil the vegetables, make a stock, chuck it in the freezer. That's then a way to save my uh, soggy carrots and yellow and broccoli. How much vegetable is it? It's like, I agree with Jimmy, five minutes. Yeah, I guess, you can, I guess if we were then to look at every single like 
well, if I waste that carrot versus cooking it and freezing it and my energy output. But, but where do we stop, I think is the, yeah. and to like this lady's point, how, how do we contribute, how do we calculate that? But it's not just the, it's not just the carrot being grown, it's the amount of energy, thank you, the amount of fertilizer, the amount of water, the land that's required, the deforestation that's happened to make that land to grow that carrot. And then the transportation, the manufacturing, the product, like that whole food supply chain is a huge contributor, mm -hmm. probably than just my one. I think it, I think it's a fine balance, right? Of how do you how do you not make it feel all doom and gloom? Like it, it is a topic of doom and gloom. Like it's not just that oh it's okay we'll be fine we won't be fine. Um, but it's it's not always going with you know a negative story. You've also got to then talk about okay well this is the the state of the land this is where we're at but actually here's what you're going to be able to do here's what the future could look like if we can reverse some of our own effects or be aware of the type of behaviours we're living in. Yeah. It doesn't make a good news headline, does it? We've got to have a shocking, scary facts, right, that make a good news headline. Um, so I'm very conscious that you guys are probably raring to go home. I think we all know the answer to this one. The three fossil fuels. That's quite good time. Yeah, natural yeah. gas, oil and coal. So that's what we rely on for our energy to make everything operate and run in the world. Um, in COP21, what was the max temperature increase threshold that we wanted by the year 2100? Mm -hmm. 1.5, yes. Um, so I didn't talk about this. Do people know what carbon sinks are? Yeah, so there's three ocean. So it takes a quarter of our carbon. Um, then you've got vegetation through photosynthesis. That takes another quarter. And then the atmosphere takes a half. Um, so, yes, sorry. I was thinking, hang on, what's else to my question? Um, so how much do these sinks take of all of our carbon? So there's three types of sinks, ocean, vegetation, atmosphere. Of all the carbon that we produce, how much do these three carbon sinks absorb? Do we think a third of it goes into these carbon sinks and the rest just contributes to additional greenhouse? A quarter of it only gets absorbed into our natural carbon sinks? Or half? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So there's only so much that the ocean can absorb. There's only so much that the, the vegetation can absorb. So that after that, it goes into the atmosphere. Now we're putting way more than the half left over. And this is what I was talking about earlier, that this additional greenhouse effect that we're creating, energy can't escape, energy can't come back. So now we're adding, the, we're thickening this greenhouse layer around the outside of the planet. And the thicker it gets, the less that can escape. So the, the heat is being kept in, increasing our temperature. You know, the more um, carbon dioxide that we put into the oceans, the more our biodiversity or marine biodiversity is affected. Increase in ocean temperature, the pH level drops. You know, the, I can never say this word, the calcareous animals then can't, you know, create their shell because their pH levels aren't right. 
and all of a sudden fish don't have anything to eat. We don't have fish, the humans don't have anything to eat. So all of a sudden our marine biodiversity is being massively impacted, but that whole food supply chain ultimately ends up with humans having no food. Right, so yeah. There is a positive from more CO2 if you can look at it that way, which is the plants are greener. It's good for them. Right? And there has been a recent study showing exactly that. In the grand scheme, it's not a good answer, right? Long term, it's not a good answer. But short term, there are some benefits to some plants, but it's not the big story. But they can only absorb, they, they can't absorb the amount that we produce, is the point. So there's a lot. <laughs> talking about your greenwashing term, there's a lot of, uh, we're going to reach net zero. So we're going to chuck out all these emissions, but don't worry, we're going to plant 50,000 trees. Okay. You're not reaching net zero. You're just trying to offset. Um, and are you really offsetting? So actually it takes a tree, I think 25 years before it can start absorbing carbon. So actually you're not offsetting. Dry out. So I think, I think, yeah, I mean, I don't want to say people are doing it. There is an element of it. But I think there's also a, there's been a, a quick and easy escape route of, oh, I'm going to become net zero. So here, I'm just going to plant some trees. Or, oh, I'm going to reduce poverty. Or, I'm just going to give out some meal donations. Right? There's far more beyond what you need to do from a social uh, point of view and far more what you need to do from an economic uh, no, environment. You know, you the the <laughs> Uh, half. Oh, yeah. So our planet can only absorb half. The rest and of it is going into the, the, the atmosphere the that. So let's say we've got 100 units of carbon dioxide. 50 of those units are being absorbed by our natural carbon sinks. The other 50% are going into the atmosphere. The atmosphere already absorbs half of the 50, but now we've got an additional 50 that is going into the atmosphere. Okay. It's, it's uh, I've tried to simplify the way, but you've got 100 units, only 50 of them can be absorbed by natural carbon sinks. And the way that those 50 are divvied up is half is atmosphere. So 25 is atmosphere, 12 and a half is ocean, 12 and a half is vegetation. But now, because we're producing so much carbon dioxide and emissions, this extra 50 is now being added on to the 25 already from the atmosphere. Does that make sense? So we've got too much in the atmosphere and that increases temperature and creates crazy weather patterns, floods, drought, uh, droughts, heat waves, and we've seen the impact of what that means. Um, so we talk about CO2, but actually that's not the only greenhouse gas that is contributing to climate change. Um, anybody want to have a go what the other two greenhouse gases are? Yeah. So that's a that's a natural. Yeah. Nitrous oxide. So yeah, CO two, methane, and nitrous oxide are our three deadly greenhouse gases. What is nitrous nitrate oxide? Good yeah, yeah, I was sure. It's not even labeled by the trees, and it's a huge brick I don't know what the biggest contributor is at the moment. I was going to say, it's kind of the soil. Yeah, 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 but what's the thing that I think the fertilizers that are living at this time? So much like when it gets, when the fossils do get burnt. Oh, really? That's one of the. Oh, it's from a. Uh, Tesla is a different gas. It's the gold point, but it's not in the event. Yeah. But this is one of them. And it happens to be one of the potential contribution is actually quite high as a as a uh, emission result or temperature contributing result because the way it impacts the way the sun rays coming bouncing off the planet and not getting out again. So it has an impact which is dramatic. Thank you. We talked about this one already. Oh sorry. Go ahead. So just uh, on these carbon things, you know these Teslas and the ones coming out of China.
Yeah, we'll just live inside. We'll live inside them. And, uh, but I mean, the reason I don't talk about, um, you know, we talk about electric cars. Again, same thing, plastic versus glass. Like, electric cars are the solution. Right, everybody should drive electric cars. Well, how do we power our electric cars here? Lots of people. You don't see what you were. Somebody heard well, you have to feel good yeah, so I think again, there's a whole uh, my my people marketing uh, tactic to uh, so yeah to help influence consumer behaviour. So conclusion, this is the end. We are here. Um, we all like to say, oh well, no, but it's not our responsibility. I can't do anything, or actually, it's a responsibility of my government. It's a responsibility of Coca Cola to reduce you know their use of plastic. It's a responsibility of the supermarkets to not use plastic packaging. There are choices that we can all make to change our daily lives. We don't have to buy that banana, single banana in a plastic wrapper at the petrol station. The protectant of the banana is the skin. Um, so there are shifts that we can make. We don't have to use the plastic or the paper bags in spinnies or car to put our veg in. We could take the reusable ones. We don't have to use plastic water bottles. We could use reusable ones. So whilst there's small changes, all small changes, if everybody did them, would ladder up to something bigger. It's not like pointing fingers, but it's sharing. Yeah. And when you don't see what others are doing. Why know. should I start? Why should I do it? Why should I start? But it doesn't support the loss. When you are feeling the loss, yeah. it doesn't work. You are not giving enough. So it's shared responsibility. The motto is don't point fingers, start with yourself, do your part. Yeah. People need to, people, people need to, yeah. people need a motivation, right? And this is something that I definitely found through Hero Go, my vegetable company, that we had 7,000 active customers a month. So it was decent size. Um, but actually, people felt a rallying towards a cause. So actually, what my job became as a marketer is to not sell a product, but to raise awareness on food waste because people just weren't aware. And then they wanted to, to become part of a cause. They wanted to become part of a mission. And then when they started receiving them, usually the first point is because of the cost reduction. And then when they start to understand, well, actually, hang on, I'm saving this much CO2 going into the atmosphere from not decomposing food. I'm saving this much water. Um, <laughs> we've got the sound effects, thank you. Um, so yeah, so how, you know, it's trying to rally and create those causes and missions that people want to create, right? So this is part of my work with Climate Fresk to do climate workshops to create people. To... And users is one group and governance is another group. Yeah. Industry is another group. Corporations and another group. brand is another group. Logistics. So you've seen there are some, some work so with Pepsi and Coca-Cola, they did some work to reform the supply chain together. But even Google, for example, yeah. they have other things. They are not replaceable. Microsoft, they have some new things. But that's where that's where legislation will take that role, right? Of enforcing yeah. that they either meet a target or they find ways to reduce the consumption. Because we are focusing on individuals. And you are seeing how much, yeah, yeah. How, how many people yeah. have enough awareness to comply yeah. out of 8 billion? 1%. But I, the way I think of the 1%, yeah. probably the one that's making 70% of the problem, so that I mean, it was a bad American UAE. Uh, so two, two thirds of the world's emissions come out of two countries. So it's then that should be more inclusive, more, not only to the end users to say, uh, well, it comes from UAE. But narrative from who? We become from UAE per person. But narrative from who is my point. Who's creating the narrative? You have that? You want your narrative. You want it. Um, yeah, which is, it goes back to this whole like triangle of inaction, because <laughs> who starts it? 
who, who's the point to, to get things moving, right? Yes, the government can play a role. Yes, they can introduce legislation, create nudges towards a better environmental behavior. Who influences people? People influence people. Put a little bit of legislation in there too. Um, yeah, and then who influences government? A, their own, but you know, multiple others and people and corporations. So it's all intertwined with how it starts, who it works yeah, with. When it gets to the point of you got ten years doing the capacity planning ban. Uh, yeah. Four years ago, five years ago. Yeah, they did that. So they see a very serious problem and it's good. And they they ban the plastic bag. So if you go to plastic bag, if you if you take a plastic bag in your luggage and you get checked, they could confiscate that from you. All right. No, it should be that you penalty, but I don't think they're doing that. I haven't checked with latest legislation. But you have to give a viable alternative. Right. And you also need to be careful about what those alternatives are because, like it or not, there's a lot of scams. A hell of a lot of scams. The flights offset. How many of those truly, truly work? Sadly, there were some big ones which didn't do what they were supposed to do, what they claimed to be doing. And when they were audited, they were shown. And the good thing is, they were audited, they were published. And that's what we've learned from that. So it's good. But okay, the, the talk of, of electric cars versus combustion. You need to think about the full life perspective. Same thing with solar arrays. Full life perspective. Production, use, maintenance, end of life, how you can sleep the whole way. Wind turbines are another one. It's a terrible life because there is no alternative use for them. And they are detrimental in some cases for not just eyesore, they're killing birds. There are ways we can have that. For each of these, you think it's full life, you can start to think of what you have to think. What is the next alternative? I will always remember a conversation I had with a few major businesses in Europe when, yeah, they had the triple bottom line for their sustainability, right? Things which they wanted to do. Did they do that? They only did that when I came forward with a, a saving of money for them. And then they had to. But unfortunately, how are, how are countries success managed, uh, rewarded or reviewed or assessed GDP? So that, that's the way that we're set up, right? That GDP is our success factor of managing whether we've done a good job or not. So unfortunately, that's just the, the way and the structure that has been set up that money makes the world move, right? There was a stamp that was done a few years ago now, sadly. So it's almost like mm -hmm. years. So Hong Kong sadly didn't calculate the conversion or technician units from US Fahrenheit to Celsius or one of the translations. And they were held by one group. That lasted many years. I remember making my first trip to Hong Kong, going into buildings, going, I need a jumper. And it's not because I'm sweating from outside, it's cold. No, I'm really cold, truly cold. There's all the UAE, I mean, I was saying, okay, the UAE is ridiculous for cold. Remember in cinema? No, I had to invent Need a blanket. Yeah. In, in Hong Kong, they realize about the GDP conference as in, it cost the country something in the order of about 1%, right? That is dramatic. Now, that's just a hero. It has lots of things go wrong with little temperature changes or measurement changes between metric and material. It's a real issue. Here, though, in the UAE, they did change about eight years ago. They changed the temperature on the metro. So they adapted that to try, because they realized that because it, it's very visible to the, to the external visitors. And that changes people's perspective quite often. Is that what the tourist mm -hmm. thing? It's not that it's cold, right? It's not that it's the moment, but they did change the temperature slightly. And they made it warmer. Basically. Yes. Where it's it, still very cold. So when it hits the pocket of someone, that makes it, they, they do something to make a difference. It doesn't hit their pocket, and that's like the same with, uh, like, I don't, it sounds bad. It's going to hit the health bill, and then, then they will, the government will do something about reducing it because their health costs. But otherwise, especially here, people are just going to leave if they seek us somewhere else. Yeah, and like I was saying, unfortunately, GDP is our success metric. So yes. I don't see that. Yeah, I don't see that changing probably in our lifetime. So <laughs> that is the way, unfortunately, that things will change. The needle will shift. Um, but it comes from a social tipping point as well, right? If we look at 
10 years ago, how many people were in a room talking about it? A very small percentage of the population. Now we look at the way that the population are now talking about sustainability. More people are talking about it. Are we doing more? Yes, we're starting to do a bit more. Are we doing enough? No. But can we create an uprising? Can we create people a movement? Can we get people to start demanding things from corporations? Um, that's when changes do start to come back. So I'm going to wrap up. Last slide, Mother Earth, let's take care of her um, and do everything that we can. Make a pledge. I'm not going to ask you to write it down now, but make a pledge or two that you think you can go away with and change, whether you personally, I don't know, pushing back, writing to a company, doing something within your own company, something within your own lifestyle, um, any positive change and behavioral change can make a big difference. So thank you. So we don't think we can do a We actually keep that from you, like the bottom of the box, so it has to be handed to you. Yeah. We used to build the bathroom spinning, Steve Smith's ship and Beige. Yeah. I've not seen them for a long time. So uh -huh. Emirates Bio Farm um, sell a box of their organic veg, they come out of the ground, however they come out of the ground. The wonky bag of, in the plastic, in the plastic. So Kipson's also do a lot of that. But then you, you driving, but you driving to the supermarket versus, but, but versus Kipson's coming and delivering to you and then you down the street. I'd like to do it all as much as possible in that shop. I've seen it in some. So I live in Motor City. So the big waitros near me, they don't have any. But I've seen it in other ones. So I think it's sporadic. Um, it's not, not, all not, not all stores do, yeah. Yeah, so what's that? Naturally. Thank you, everybody online, for hanging on <laughs> and listening in the background. Um, if there's any questions, did we get all through all the questions? Let guests see. Uh, where food, food waste is. You have a guest who will eat first before the host. Yeah. So, yeah oh a lot of the african and caribbean cultures you bring a container and you're taking home whatever's left <laughs> how, how people consume a, a chicken a whole chicken or even just a chicken on the bone and you compare that around the world you'll see sadly western cultures will leave quite a lot that could be used yeah. and then you go to various countries in africa and you just see the photos of the before and after you see a massive difference between not just the heavier proper chickens in some places and not, but actually what's left in the carpet is nothing. Bone is used. Yeah, yeah. Broth, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Oh, I can stop. Yeah. <laughs>